my name is Matthew Goverick. Um, I work at Fuga along with all the lovely uh, downtown folks. Um, I'm based in Los Angeles and I look after marketing strategy for the company. Um, and I'm joined here by a lovely group of people. Thank you all for making the time today. Um, I'm just gonna go from my screen from the left to the right. So we've got Kevin and Ian, um, AKA Hyper Potions. Hey, uh, we hey. Have, hey, we have Lauren Singer joining us. Guys. And then we also have Vincent uh, Diamante. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? I got to get that right. Yeah, that sounds good. Diamante. Perfect. Your mic sounds amazing. And I'm very jealous <laughs> of your setup right now. Um, so yeah, we've got about 45 minutes and then we're going to do um, a little bit of Q&A. Um, so I don't know how many questions we're going to have. So let's just jump right into it. Um, yeah, I'd love for you guys to just do just a quick round of introductions, you know, talk about yourselves a little bit, and then we'll jump into the conversation. Um, Ian and Kevin, would you mind going first? Sure. Hey, yeah, so I'm Ian Sciura. This is Kevin Vallejo. Hey. We met on the internet in like 2014. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, DM'd on SoundCloud. Yeah, SoundCloud. Uh, we liked each other's music, so thought we'd, you know, strike up conversation, and mm -hmm. uh, we collaborated from there. Yeah, we've been making yeah. music together ever since, and he's here in California right now. Yeah. It's the first time in a long time. <laughs> yeah, like two years since we were yeah. in the same room. He's so. originally from Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we started uh, we started Hyper Potions in 2015 specifically, um, and then, um, you know, we'll go into it more about how we started making music for video games, but uh, pretty much just started with uh, trying to make fun, happy uh, music that's, you know, EDM leaned, but it doesn't have to be. It could be like pop produced too. Mm -hmm. Rock um, inspired rock, too. Yeah. Just anything that's fun and, and energetic. Uh, we just love to make. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. We're going to get into a lot of this. So I'll, I'll just keep yeah. it going. I'm going to try to moderate as, as best as I can yeah. here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Lauren, I'd love to, to get your introduction as well. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lauren Singer. I am a voice actress, I'm a voice director, and a singer-songwriter who writes original music. Um, I collaborate with other creatives, composers, and musicians to create original content. So um, again, we'll get more into my crazy story, but uh, that's me in a nutshell. Awesome, thank you. And Vincent, last but certainly not least, get in the ring. All right. All right. Uh, so my name is Vince Diamante. I've been working specifically in game music for, um, I guess, close to 15 years now. Um, I actually started out doing some very, very basic stuff in the mid 2000s. Uh, things like making ringtones for, you know, cell phones, because there were cell phones before the iPhone hit. Um, uh, but that led into making games and making games on cell phones before the iPhone hit is not something that I wish on my, on my worst enemies, quite honestly. Uh, but yeah, since then, I've just been making video game music for uh, a really long time, uh, mostly embedded in the game developer. So I, I often work um, like all these other uh, employees at various game developers uh, doing either mobile games. Uh, I'm actually still doing mobile games right now, kind of a, a weird ironic loop there, but also console games, arcade games, PC games. Um, I'm very much a game music and sound designer type of person. And uh, I really like that. Awesome, thank you. Um... Yeah, there's, there's gonna be a lot to get into there. I have a lot of questions for you, I think. Um, so yeah, let's just kind of talk about paths a little bit and how you all kind of got started and, and all this. I think we just scratched the surface. Um, Lauren, I would love to start with you. Um, yeah, you mentioned that that you- uh, Boy, putting me yeah. in the hot seat, huh? Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna put you in the hot seat. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I mean, I would love to hear how you kind of got started because you do have such a diverse set of skills. You're obviously multidisciplined based off of your introduction. We've talked a little bit. Um, so yeah, I please feel free to start wherever you want. Um, the guiding light is just, how did you get into creating music for video games? But However you want to get there, um, we can start at the beginning. But yeah, I'd, I'd love to start with you and, and see where we go. 
Okay, well, I know we have only so much time, so I want to really try to focus it on what I people who are familiar with me want to hear about, which is Bendy. I know you guys want to hear about Bendy, so um, I'm going to give you a nutshell version, and then we'll go into that story, because that's it's, it's a great story. Um, you know, my crossroads dream come true moment was really all one and the same. I went from wanting to throw in the towel in voiceover, and I should mention that I've been doing voiceover since 1999 um, in various different um, venues from audiobooks to commercials, and then of course video games, which I built out my home studio, and that's when it became pretty much, I would say, the primary source of work that I would get is video games, and really what I loved anyway. I love the character work. That's, that's what I live for is the character work. Um, so, you know, I went from wanting to throw in the towel in VO to Alice Angel and Bendy and the Ink Machine and everything else that followed, uh, including writing a song for her, um, for Alice Angel in the game and challenging myself in ways I have never challenged myself before. Um, this was definitely a life-defining moment for me and one that I am so, so proud to talk about. Um, so I'm happy to start here. Um, did you have any questions before I continue on? I think the one thing that I think we're all going to have, there's going to be like a, uh, a connectivity point here is uh, the home studio bit. Do you feel mm -hmm. like building the home studio was kind of, is that what opened it all up? Because Absolutely. I think in this independent space, yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I did that in 2008. So I started in 99. Uh, and most of the work that I was getting when I started to really get myself out there was local. And you hit a ceiling, you know? Now, I was told you have to live where the work is. And I have to tell you that is not true. It wasn't true back in the early 2000s. You know, I'm, I had a mentor that said that, like, what are you talking about? Like, who told you that, you know? And, but there were people that wouldn't hire me, you know, for opportunities because I didn't live where the work is. But that landscape has changed quite a bit. Um, but yeah, 2008, definitely, you know, it, it, it's, it opened the door. I was able to work in video games all over the world. So um absolutely i recommend get yourself a home studio you do not have to spend a ton of money to do it either yeah i know i totally agree with that um i had a question about um platforms that we're all fans of but i think we'll get to that in a little bit i think this is a good pivot point over to um over to ian and kevin um you know you guys met over the internet as well yeah. um I'm assuming you have something to say about not living where the work is but yeah. um tell me if i'm wrong but i'd love to yeah hear how you guys connected over the internet and and how that kind of led to 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 start yeah um making making video game music or music for video games sorry yeah um so pretty much uh like i said we kind of started just dming each other um that led to just kind of like a friendship just messaging each other back and forth and then working on a song. Uh, and that song led to just kind of trying really hard. Um, we realized this, the first song we made together was really good. So, um, you know, we pitched it to labels and Monster Cat picked it up, if you guys are familiar with Monster Cat. Um, and that led to us just, you know, we we're like, okay, well, I guess this is our career now. <laughs> yeah, I kind of just <laughs> fell into it. Yeah, I, I've been trying to make music since like 2003. It was like an after school, junior high school hobby. I uh, just came from school and wanted, you know, wanted to work on music, but I uh, never really took it seriously until that moment. Um, so you don't definitely don't need to have a big setup. Like I just had yeah. a laptop and headphones. Yeah. So there was this meme going around on Twitter recently where it was <laughs> yeah. like, don't trust the guy who uses this setup. And it's like a Scarlet 2 it <laughs> interface and ATH and 50X headphones. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that's what I used for like my entire career. <laughs> <laughs> and also like uh, T Lopes, the person who composed the entire Sonic Mania soundtrack. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, this is why I wrote the entire soundtrack with. Yeah. <laughs> so you definitely don't need to be in person or even have, have a fancy gear. gear. Uh, the passion, and I would say the most important thing besides just your passion and creating the songs is actually like selling it to the world. Mm -hmm. um, trying really hard to get out there because uh, if it wasn't for that, I don't think Ian and I would have even been in person today uh, to be able to give this panel speech because... <clears throat> Um, we just needed to email, you know, get it out there, yeah. get into the hands of people that uh, would be able to have a bigger audience than we would alone. Totally. And I mean, I feel like Monster Cat is such a big 
platform for this. And I kind of mm-hmm. wanted to talk about the community around that as well. But in yeah. terms of pitching the music around, um, so yeah, y'all met on SoundCloud, right? Was the answer. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. I know, and I don't know if this exists as much anymore, but you used to be able to drop demos through through SoundCloud to labels. Is that how you guys got in touch with Monster Cat or was it email? Because I was, think you guys kind of yeah. hit the jackpot on that one. So I think we did too. They used to of, have yeah. um like a service on their website. You it was like a demo it. box yeah, on their own box. website. Yeah. Uh, I think they got rid of that like a long time ago though. Yeah. So yeah, we I was kind of just like a Hail Mary. We were we were sending our song off to a bunch of different people just with no expectation. Yeah. We were just hoping for the best because we were like, yeah. hey, this is a good song. Um want to get in the right right hands because if we self-released it and just put on SoundCloud free like what everyone did at the time yeah and what we did too um yeah. we knew it wasn't going to go anywhere so sometimes you just got to believe in what you do and what you made and try to get it the best possible you know outcome sure yeah the hustle is real and I think mm-hmm. there there sometimes is a bit of like a disparaging vibe or view on on, on submitting demos through some yeah. usual channels but I mean I've worked on the label side as well and I definitely listen to those demos I know people are um mm-hmm. you know I'm not saying it's it's a slam dunk but like you guys are saying you're putting passion into it and you know you know you put your time into it and it worked out so yeah if you know for the folks that don't know how to put music you know don't know how to sell their music or get it across like these are ways to do it a lot of those demo accounts don't exist anymore but there are still ways or guessing emails and stuff like that i mean yeah. if you can get your passion across then i do think that you know someone's yeah. gonna listen i think as a as a creator you need the creative side and you need the business side um and you just do it separately though um just after you made it then try to sell it Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, that's a good pivot point over to Vincent in terms of the business and the creative side. So you, I, I'm not, I'm not too familiar with your work on the developer side. Um, music. Yes. I, but I'd love to hear, yeah. Where, where you kind of entered the fold here and where that journey started. Yeah. It's, it's actually really funny listening to you guys. Cause I feel like it's a, an interesting counterpoint. Like I'm okay at the creative side you know i'm obviously i'm a musician um and i'm eh, i'm not that great at the business side but i was really good at the technical side so when i was working on cell phone games literally what i was doing was i would bring my kind of crappy laptop over to the offices at konami (laughs) that was my first real gig of any sort not just game but any sort of game sound gig and i would sit down there with my laptop and most importantly, I knew how to work with all these game developers in different ways. And I understood uh, what they were doing from a technical perspective. Um, so I wasn't actually very good at selling myself as a musician at that time, but I could sell myself as I understand what game developers want and what game designers want to do with stuff. So, um, and if you give me a little bit of time, I could get my music and sound into the projects that they're working on really quickly. And that was a lot of my gigs. So once I moved on from Konami, I went to some other projects. Sometimes I was an employee or sometimes I was a contractor, but very often I would still embed myself in with a developer and say, hey, I think I have a good idea about how to work with you guys when it comes to the game. and uh, the stories that you have there. It just so happens that I think the stories for a creative director are these very you know large and high level things like, oh, I want this type of music for this type of uh, big character pivot that's going to happen. Um, but besides talking to them, I was really good at talking to individual designers and programmers and thinking about the stories that they cared about. Oh, I've got this little sound effect that I've got here, or I've got this little mechanic that's happening in the game here. And I could look at that and realize, oh, you want this type of stinger in order to hit at this particular point. I can make that happen for you. Um, And that's how I was actually able to start selling myself in this whole game music business. Later on, I got better at selling myself as a musician, but that's definitely how I started there. Could I ask when you went, did you, I don't know if you mentioned this. I'm sorry if I missed it. When you went to Konami, what, what, what games were you guys were like, what era were we talking Castlevania? Oh, where, where are we at here? 
Yeah, mid 2000s. So okay. I, I worked on an original Castlevania cell phone game. Um, I worked on a lot of ports of games. So um, like Contra came out for the Nintendo DS. And then this team that was there in SoCal in Manhattan Beach, they would port the game to various cell phones at the time in the mid 2000s. And I was part of that porting team. Got you. Got you. Okay. I've read a lot about the porting of Metal Gear Solid games. So this is, mm-hmm. this is, this is very interesting reads if anyone's into this kind of stuff, but um, it definitely goes down a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, okay. Awesome. So I, I don't know who wants to take this question. I'm happy to, to, to cherry pick if anything, but um, so we've kind of talked about how, we're, how y'all got started, et cetera. Um, the question, the kind of the question of the mantra here is um, if you could talk to yourself and get into a time machine right now um, at the outset of getting into your first composition work, what would you tell your past self? Is there anything that you would kind of, you know, warn them about or would you nudge them towards a certain direction? I, I would just kind of love to hear any conversation starters on this. I mean, I can start. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think it would be uh, actually uh, give myself some slack. Um, I definitely gave myself a lot of like negative talk at the time, like uh, a lot of, uh, you know, like, hey, you like, you can't really do this. You're literally just like kind of fell into this career, kind of like self sabotaging talk. Um, and it definitely probably helped me back a little bit for the first couple of years of thinking that I was good enough to be doing this at all. And I think a lot of us as creatives feel this way when we're making anything, we don't think we're, you know, we're imposter syndrome. We just don't think we're good enough to, to do it. But uh, I think that's you just trying to protect yourself from pain. But the only way to like actually achieve success is to do it anyway uh, and try to shoot for the top um, and do what you want to do in your day to day. Uh, and if what you want to do is make music for games and just do that, try all you can, even if it leads to failure, at least you tried. So I wish I, I could tell great. myself that. Yeah. Yeah. We could all be a little bit easier on ourselves. Yeah. Right? yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Lauren, I'd love to hear your, uh, your take on this. Sure. I mean, the one piece of advice, and I think this is something that I knew, but at the same time, as I had mentioned earlier, you know, there was those moments of wanting to throw in the towel. Uh, you know, the entertainment industry is a tough industry. Anybody will tell you that. Um, you know, I graduated from Ithaca College. I, I, I've been in music. I'd, stu- I'd studied music since I was 13. Um, and I knew I wanted to do something with my voice. It was really The Little Mermaid that uh, Disney's Little Mermaid was the kind of like my aha defining moment of combining those two passions of both music and voiceover into one career. So I was like, okay, well, how do I go about doing this? I don't know anybody that does voice acting or I could talk to about this. So I'm gonna go the path of music to start. And I figured, you know, I graduated from Ithaca with a degree in voice and an outside field in modern languages. I worked really hard. And I, when I got out there, it's like, okay, well, you know, I should be able to scratch a living doing weddings and that kind of thing. Um, But then I realized that musicians are not the most reliable creatures on the face of this planet. (laughs) And um, I was getting frustrated because I was the one doing all the work and I was the one pushing everyone. And there just, there wasn't a commitment from the other people. And it was heartbreaking. And so I started figuring, well, what can I do with my life that I don't have to rely on anyone else for? And that became voiceover. But voiceover is not easy either. And one of the challenges is, you know, when a game, when a game, they want to bring in celebrities, you get replaced. When a game um, goes union, then the actors who are non-union can no longer work on that project and they also get replaced. So it's one thing, like I had made my peace with, if I audition, I don't get a part, fine, no big deal. But to have something that you earn taken away from you and given to someone else There is just nothing more soul crushing in my mind than that. And the one piece of advice that that I, and again, I knew it, but I wish I had had myself now to tell myself with this experience that I've had, look, just keep going, you know, keep your head down and just don't give up whatever you do. Don't give up. You want this and you are going to put in the work to make it happen. 
It might not happen the way that you think it's going to. It probably won't, but it will happen. Just don't give up. And um, that's really, you know, my, that's, that's the best piece of advice I would give myself or anyone with anything when it comes to passion, being passionate about something. Yeah, I know. I, and I, it's, I think, I think, um, I think you guys are saying something very similar in terms of, yeah, cutting yourself some slack and not giving up and, and kind of, you know, continuing to chip away at it. Um, Vincent, I don't know if you have anything to add to this. I'll, I'll let you go real quick if you want. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that there's a lot of that, that I totally feel, I think I'll just add a little bit, which is that, yeah, besides not letting yourself get down with anything that doesn't work out, um, there's so much space out there that's left to be discovered. Um, uh, it's not just a matter of, oh, wow, there's a whole lot of gigs out there. There are so many things that you don't know is a possibility for you. Um, there are so many potential collaborators that are way beyond the horizon. You know, as far as you can go high up in terms of vision of this whole space of music and games, there's always somewhere else that you can go and check out. And we're more, um, we're more able to move around than ever before in order to make things work. So there, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a great, it's a really a great place to be, even if you're getting emails of, oh yeah, this isn't going to work out. You, you, you keep on getting them. That is such a small fraction of everything that is out there. Yeah, and I think I, I I agree. I mean, I feel like, you know, things like Rocket League didn't exist, you know, I don't know how old that game is, 15, 20 years ago. Fortnite obviously didn't exist. It was a completely different Steam didn't exist, you know, X years ago either. So there is no shortage of places um to to there's no shortage of opportunity. I wanted to talk about Bandcamp a little bit as well, but um firstly, I kind of just wanted to ask the group um whether it is Steam or Bandcamp or or Discord or whatever, um, what platforms do you know do you guys find exciting right now? What, what do you think is around the corner? I'd, yeah, I, I think maybe the group would um, would benefit hearing from you what what you have your eye on or what maybe something that's not worth our time. You know, things like that. If um, anyone wants to, yeah, I can, or, I can jump. Yeah, either way, um, I, even though we met on SoundCloud, um, I just don't feel like it's a uh ideal place to meet yeah. collaborators anymore it's going less and less viable yeah it's I'm still not... a great place to to find new artists yeah. sometimes but it's 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 not nearly what it used to be yeah i would say no one in my peer group uh really cares or checks about soundcloud anymore i would say no one really focuses on anything other than twitter and discord uh, I say those are the two platforms that people actually pay attention to the most um, and then collaborate on the most and also mm -hmm. get the most um, business started on there. Yeah, and now, now you're yeah. seeing artists making their own discords and having their own whole community in one yeah. place. And every time they release something, everyone gets pinged to that. Yeah. Everyone goes and checks it out at the same time. And I will say, I think the best part about Discord in terms of business collaboration is that you can not have it only be business like you can just be hanging out with someone mm -hmm. be playing games with them maybe you play apex you know once a week with someone that makes a game two years down the line they hire you to make a you know a soundtrack for their game mm -hmm. uh, because you're already close friends with them and you didn't even really like know them when you first started playing games with them maybe they're just friend or a uh, friend of a friend and that happens so i, I would say that's kind of a path that we had was like we just happened to know someone and they just liked us enough to help us you know pitch it at the company mm -hmm. um and then we were we were in on a game <laughs> that's wild yeah there's yeah. something to be said about the authenticity of it and being able to you know it's not just check out my new song it's, yeah. it's also mm -hmm. here's a demo or you know here's some yeah. art that i'm working on or something like that and being able to yeah. start conversation and you think most of that's happening over Discord versus yeah. versus Twitter, I think? Because I think Twitter is a little bit of a... Yeah. You know. Twitter, I feel like you can know someone because you're interacting with their tweets. But Discord, you can actually know them uh, by actually being in a voice call with like five other people in a server. And I'm not, I'm not even talking about the highest level of Discord servers. I mean, just even just like close personal mutual friend ones. 
uh, maybe that person ends up, like I said, making a game sometime. And because you were on their radar, because you're always in that server, they just happen to think of you specifically right. over anyone else they could have thought of because you're just in their circle. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's a big thing. Yeah. I might be reaching here a little bit, but do you think the pandemic sped that up? The I think so. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Because we never really did anything other than stay inside and talk in Discord. So. Yeah. We're, <laughs> sure. It's funny because like our our lives basically stayed the same, at least like our working lives. Yeah. Uh, it was always just working remotely and working behind two computers from different sides of the country. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I guess in that way, we're not affected as badly. Yeah. And we, we're already used to just the working at home thing, working remotely thing. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so just to clarify, so this is the first time you guys have been together since when? Since 2019. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. The last time we saw each other was Anime Expo 2019. We, we performed there. Yeah. But we're still getting stuff done through like Dropboxing project files right. back and forth. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I'm sorry, I would have sent you guys a pizza or something to, share, <laughs> to celebrate this. That's awesome. Well, I'm That's glad you guys got it. I'm glad that you guys we, are. You guys we've, are been, yeah. we've been yeah. able to spend some time. At, Kevin's still here for a few more days. We've been getting a lot of work done. We were actually able to play our first show since 2019 uh, yeah. yesterday. In San yeah, we Francisco. just played a uh, Roblox developers conference yesterday. That was fun. Cool, cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you guys. Yeah, like I said, I'm glad you guys are together, and that's that's mm -hmm. that's good. Positivity, it's good. Um, okay. Yeah, in terms of yeah, for 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 platforms that you you that Lauren and 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 Vincent that you're using or you find interesting. It, um, yeah, I just want to give you guys the the floor if you have anything to to tack on here. I mean, I agree with with um, what both Kevin and Ian said is uh, Discord and Twitter. Uh, you know, it's a great way to connect with people. I think with Twitter, it's more uh, direct, whereas Discord, it's more of like collaborative. And at least that's that's how I've found it and how I've used it. So just you know, tacking on what what you guys said. Yeah, uh, just echoing that, uh, especially Discord. I mean, it's actually really cool to do some collaboration on, on Discord uh, or, or even just like, you know, a little bit of passive sort of, um, I don't know, sort of osmosis stuff where people are just hanging out in voice chat and, you know, willing to share some sounds and just, you know, redirect some things there. It's like, okay, cool. It's You can really get to know a person on Discord. Uh, like Kevin and Ian were saying, and I, mm -hmm. I love it. Cool. And, and in terms of, um, for, in terms of getting your music out to people, um, let's say, um, you know, let's say you don't have, you don't have a, a, a deal with, with a label or something like that. Um, what, are there any distribution channels, platforms, things that you find it interesting or would you know feel like you would be delivering the content to the right type of listener um is there anything in in that world that you would recommend or find interesting you know setting up a band camp page and putting stuff up there um yeah i'm just i'm just kind of curious and i keep going back to Bandcamp because i just i personally really feel like in terms of an indie composer that really blew the lid off a couple of years ago you know you have stuff like disaster piece uh composing for I'm, I'm blanking on the on the games right now to top of my head but um you know I think that is such a vibrant place to kind of connect and support a composer but is there any am I on the right path there or do you feel like there are other places to go and it can be Spotify it's totally fine if I'm not I'm not here to say that Spotify is the end all be all but yeah I was just kind of curious what um where your heads kind of go in terms of sharing your music with folks yeah uh, I can start again um uh, I'll give a very, I would say, probably unique answer here because I don't think many people follow this path. So um, take that as you will. But I think one of the best places, uh, at least for game dev, and then if you're trying to do more of the indie music side, is just thinking outside the box of what other companies would want this. You have to almost, uh, for me, I have to have an idea before I even start the idea. And then that inspires the creativity and then I pitch it. So a good example is like, um, uh, I think I think one of the games that I really wanted to work on was Rocket League. And we ended up getting a song in Rocket League, which is amazing. But we came into that track with the idea that like, hey, this would be good for Rocket League. And then that helped lean the composing 
or like producing style to match Rocket League's visuals. So we would like pull up a YouTube video of Rocket League on mute, make sure that like when we're listening to it, it like sounds right based on like what we're watching and then pitch that uh, as best we can. Um, whether it's if you have an email or not, just trying to get it in the hands of someone. Um, but in, in terms of more of like a global, like how do I increase my own like listener count? Um, I think YouTube channels help. Uh, they're kind of coming back with like some like lo-fi channels are coming back specifically. Um, they went away for a little bit, but just trying to get a bigger channel to enjoy your song enough that they would upload it and then get your name out there more it still is a great opportunity for lower follower people that just want to have that big break yeah like promotion youtube channels yeah that's probably the easiest way to kind of get your music out there to a bigger audience if you're just starting out is to reach out to those, those kinds of promoters because yeah. it's really difficult when you're just like even for us um back in like 2017 is that when we did our first self-release yeah, 2017 was our first self-release on YouTube. Um, yeah, after we started kind of uh, getting some tracks denied by labels, we were like, oh my God, what do we do? Yeah. And um, that's when we decided to just put our music out on YouTube, just independently. Yeah, and it happened It happened to catch the algorithm, uh -huh. um, whether it was like the thumbnail or the title or whatever it was, it just, clicked at the time and YouTube promoted it. Yeah. So we got lucky, but... I can't say that's always the path, but sometimes that can be a path. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are ebbs and flows in the whole yeah. YouTube algorithm thing. And sometimes your yeah, sometimes your song gets caught caught in the algorithm and sometimes it doesn't. But yeah. I still think that's one of the better ways to get your music out there next to like the whole SoundCloud yeah. route. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, it's it's fascinating. We've been talking for a half hour and we didn't talk about YouTube yet. So that's yeah, uh, I, I didn't even notice that just now. Um, that's 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 fascinating. So yeah, I, I think that I think that makes a lot of sense. I think um Vincent and and, and Lauren, do you have um, you know, yeah, do you agree on the on the YouTube side? Are there any other kind of platforms that 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 you would be looking at? Yeah, I think that's that's definitely cool. Um I kind of want to do a little tangent, which is um for me, I really like to ingratiate myself with the developer, whether I'm embedded or I'm an employee or not, and have them help out. So for example, if I'm working with an indie developer or maybe even an indie that's actually perhaps larger, like a dozen people or so, they might not realize that being their own music publisher is an option for them. And like, hey, hey, I know you know, we can do all sorts of things with the music. Um, I'm doing this thing. Let's say I'm doing this thing work for hire. So you can do a lot of this stuff with this music um, and you can actually get a lot in terms of promotion, maybe even a little in terms of income and royalties, uh, obviously make sure that writers and, and whatnot still go to you, et cetera, et cetera. But Hey, you indie dev company, you should set up something really easily, you know, fill out some forms, be a publisher on ASCAP, do some stuff on TuneCore or something and release the soundtrack. That'll be great. So you have a couple people at the game developer actually advocating for you unintentionally because, well, you know, they've got this thing from you already and they want to keep on uh, going with the momentum there. So you don't have to do this all by yourself, regardless of the path that you take. Yeah, no, I mean, Amen to that. I think um, shout out Song Trust for uh, for for organizing today, and I think it's you're you're 100 right. I mean, you know, there are so many different revenue channels that that you know a lot. Of, I can't blame a creative at the end of the day for missing out on things. At the end of the day, you guys are the artists. You're making you're making the music, and some folks just have a more of a you know knowledge base for this than others. It's so different now than it used to be. You know. We used to be able to upload on SoundCloud and that's it. Great. People can react now. Things will get taken down, et cetera, et cetera. It's, you know, how do you make sure that every penny is accounted for, et cetera? So you're hundred percent right. And that's the right tangent to, uh, to mention. So I'm glad that you did that. Thank you. Um, and then, yeah, uh, Lauren, I, I don't know if you have anything else that you wanted to add on this um, from your path. Yeah. You know, well, um, 
first off, I have loved hearing the ideas from everybody else. I, I think you guys just have, you know, just for visionaries in terms of how you get your music out there. And I applaud you for it. I think it's really smart. Um, you know, for me, I found that oh, a couple things. I mean, you know, if you're working with an IP that has a really big following already, you can use the music that you write for that IP to get your stuff out there. But you can also collaborate with people who have a big following and cross promote. So they promote you, you promote them. You know, I find it's always good to have friends in the industry and have people that you can work with so that you can help each other. You know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in win-win relationships and um, it's all about helping each other. Absolutely agree. I mean, things like, I, I love that on Steam, you can buy Stardew Valley and get the soundtrack as a bundle. You know, that's, wasn't really being, I mean, I'm sure it's been done in the past, but the fact that the composer of the music can come with the game. So you want to, you know, back in the day, you would get what a Zelda CD if you get the N64 cartridge or something, but it's, yeah, there should be win-win because there is work going into both sides. Um, I wanted to ask, you as well in terms of the collaboration. And Lauren, yeah, I'd love to start with you because I think, um, you know, with Kevin and Ian, we've talked about how you guys have been approaching, you know, for Rocket League. Vincent, I'd love to talk about the Sony properties a little bit. Um, and then Lauren, in terms of collaboration, like you were just saying, kind of the win-win side, um, how do you approach the collab process in general? Like, are you, um, and sorry if I'm being a little naive here, but are you coming with an original body of work and then trying to, you know, shop it for the right partner? Or is it more of you're getting a spec of a project and then starting to create the, the music? It's usually more that I have a spec of a project and then I'm creating off of that. And a spec of a project is usually, you know, a creative burst, uh, you know, like that, that just like a spark that ignites a, bind, a bonfire. So, you know, I get very excited and I share that excitement with my circle. And, you know, one thing that's just so rewarding to me is that the people that I've worked with, it, I, I really, again, I told you, I believe in win-win relationships and I really like to treat the people that I work with, you know, as, as well as I can. I want this to be a great experience for them and I mean it and I tell them that. And so anything I can do to help make it a great experience for all of us, I, it's a collaboration, you know, it's not the same without them. Um, I think has really created loyalty with the people that I work with. Um, you know, it's like I worked on a lonely angel, I'll be your angel. And three of the people that I worked with on that project all were happy, thrilled to come back to work on another song that um, I'm working on right now. So uh, it was great to be able to reach out to them and of course we'll do it. Like, the, you know, they were as enthusiastic and as excited as almost as I was, you know, working on a new song. Um, so for the collaborative process, I really believe it's just treat people the way you want to be treated. And, you know, you'll find that they'll bring you into their collaborations and then you bring them into yours and everybody wins. So, um, you know, that's really that's that's how I do it and that's what I believe in. That's excellent. Yeah, there's something to be said about collaboration and community. And if everyone's having a positive experience, chances are you might work together again and continue and to build people forward. Credit where credit's due. That's the other thing. I'm I always make sure to give people credit where credit's due. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um Thank you. And then mm -hmm. for Vincent, I was just curious, do you have anything to add maybe from a perspective of like the, the, the composition work you did for Sky and Flower, were you given a build of the game and then you started creating? Because those are very, lack of a better term, kind of conceptual, you know, it's not what you traditionally expect from a video game. So I'd love to hear if there's anything that you'd be, you know, willing to share on that side. Yeah, those things are... <laughs> They're a little bit wacky, and uh, considering how wacky they are, they are also really quite amorphous at the beginning. So um, something like Flower, which is a Sony PlayStation 3 game, and it's published by Sony. Uh, Sony is, of course, a big company. They want all their ducks in a row, and you, when you sign a contract agreement, you have some line items there that you have to hit, you know, that's it's legally binding. You're going to do this many songs, this many minutes. There's these expectations there. 
But when the game that you are collaborating with, uh, the game developers that you're collaborating with have different ideas and they're going to move in different directions, you have to have uh, some flexibility in order to make things work really well. And that sometimes flies in the face of a very inflexible contract. Um, so if I'm going to Sony, who is the game publisher, and saying, oh, can we do some adjustments? Can we do some uh, addendums? Especially if it works out, say, in my favor in terms of having to do more work or more minutes of music. I've always found that they're perhaps a little bit reticent to make those changes, uh, but that makes sense. You know, the music is just such a small part of this. They don't need to worry about that too much. Yeah, you should be able to figure it out. But on the game development side, it kind of connects back to that idea of, you know, making friends and, you know, your game developers are not just people that you throw music over the fence to and they're gonna put the music in. Um, you know, they were part of this collaborative music making process too. And they are part of that conversation as to what does the game really need? And so they're pressing on from their side and it's much easier to make those changes as needed. You know, it's not just you, it's the game developers and you're trying to make this big collaborative project. You know, games are, I love games so much because they're such a big collaboration. There's so many dozens and dozens of people working on it and you can trace Back, all these cool design elements and experiences to individuals making cool decisions, really, you know, big light bulb moments here and there. And you make those friends. Uh, yeah, I, I love it. That's, that's, yeah, that, that's an interesting perspective kind of coming off of, of, of Lauren's path and then, and then hearing you kind of working with, uh, with a bigger entity like, like Sony and what that looks like. Um, and then I'm just going to pass the, the ball over to uh, the Hyper Potions crew, right? Would you say this is kind of similar to your experience with, with, with Rocket League or am I totally off on that? Is there, yeah, I'd just love to give you yeah. guys the floor. Should I go? Hey. Um, so yeah, when everyone else was thinking uh, or when everyone else was talking about it, I was thinking this is definitely what they, what they do is definitely like the correct thing. I was like, yeah, that sounds, sounds right to me. We just had a, such a different experience because we were like EDM producers in like mainstream EDM music. And then we got into video game music. So um, one thing I wanted to mention that's going to be different than what was path, because like I would say that they're, they're definitely correct, um, is that I guess if you are more on like following our path, we're just like you're producing music, but you want to be in video games, um, you could start with trying to get like sync placements um because how we actually got into video games was through sync placements like we had a friend at a company who liked one of our songs and got it yeah, into a game uh trailer and then the company employees liked our song so much in that trailer they wanted to hire us the original stuff so i'd say it's like very different uh because that's probably doesn't happen that much um, but I think that could be a path of tr then trying to do, you know, like what Vincent was talking about. Um, and uh, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts? No? I don't think I have anything to add. Yeah, I, I think that could be like another, you know, kind of path that um, is, you know, unique, but also can work for people that, you know, just make, I would say like EDM or like electronic music that can then compose for games. Cool. Yeah. And I would say going back to the sync stuff, um, would you be able to expand a little bit on that? Is that more of just yeah. a networking thing, just cold emails or is that a little bit? It was both for us. Um, we got lucky in that I just already knew someone, um, but it was also, that wasn't a given, like we weren't guaranteed to get a sync placement off a of friendship, you know? Um, it just happened to line up, like they needed a song for a trailer and uh, we just released a song and it happened to like fit the trailer. Look, you know, um, he's like, well, we could just use stock music or the music yeah. from the game, but uh, I want to use something unique here. Um, and they didn't have a big budget, you know, so we were like, well, I'll take anything at this point. This would be amazing to be part of a game trailer. Uh, so we said, yes, we took a low payment and uh, that led to them being very grateful. And that led to them being like, hey, like, let's work on something else next time, too. Um, and then other people at the company, like I said, were like, yeah, this would be awesome to I know, hire them for something unique and custom for us. Um, so just be flexible with your path. And I think you'll find like 
like everyone else talked about this call, like there's going to be different paths you could take. Everyone has different skills here in this call um, and different you know paths they've taken. Um, if you're flexible and like have unique ideas of like, hey, can I just like cold email a company and hopefully that they'll take this for a sync placement, it might work. It worked for us once. Just cold email someone and be like, hey, like I know this is kind of crazy, uh, but I, I wrote this song with the idea of like being for this game. Uh, would you consider it? Uh, and then here's the link. Um, you know, I really appreciate your time. That kind of email could, you know, start it or it could just be ignored, but you never know until you try. Right, right. Well, I think there's something to be said about the, what you just said right there about the cold email is yeah. you wrote the content with the project in mind versus, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, just to, just to the disclaimer, it's like, I wouldn't say, yeah, it's probably a no-go to just say, Hey, just reaching out. Are there any opportunities for <laughs> yeah. sense? You know, here are my demos, you know, and yeah, those emails do exist, but coming at it from a more like I did my homework, I came prepared. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the shot in the dark and kind of putting your best foot forward or, you know, until you make a connect at one of those, yeah. one of those companies. Once you do it, it becomes easier, but to get into the, someone's ears, you have to like, you know, I would say be very honest and genuine with like what you're doing and people like that. Just be like, hey, like this is an email that's totally out of nowhere. Uh, just be very genuine with it because, you know, people appreciate that. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, that, that's, 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 that's great advice. Um, I am conscious of time. I'm going to, I, we have a couple of, of questions here. I am, I'm going to close my eyes and pick one. Um, let's start with one for Lauren here. I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but definitely want to give you an opportunity to talk about this a bit more. Um, sorry, that's, that's a dog. I have that's a lawnmower, my, so. That's the same thing. They're, my dog and a lawnmower Sorry. are essentially the Sorry. same thing. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I apologize. So, um, yeah, Lauren, what's a good way to get started as, as a voice talent? Oh, well, you know, it, first thing is to figure out what you like, you know, and then spend some time with it. So if, like, let's say you like animation, watch animation and learn from the greats. That's really, you know, I'm mostly self-taught as a voice actress. I have done some training. I have taken some classes. I do have a mentor who I love to death, but she came on much later in my career. I really, you know, I was a child of the eighties. I grew up watching the cartoons of that time period. And so I listened to the greats. And that's the other thing, listen to the greats, go back and check out Mel Blanc and check out June Foray and check out, you know, my hero, Frank Welker, I adore him. Um, you know, you will be blown away by the talent of these people. And, you know, I mean, from an early age, I used to mimic the voices I'd hear as a kid. You know, I was, I was always a weird kid and I'm, I'm still weird. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good and it's good to embrace that, you know? So if that's, if that's your passion, then spend time with that. Or if it's commercials, then watch lots of commercials and get a feel for the kind of commercials. Whatever resonates with you is what I would say, is find what resonates with you. And then um, a couple things, take acting classes. You can go to your college, you can go to your high school, they're free and just get some experience acting. Get some experience. Now, I will tell you that acting on stage and because I, I, I did quite a bit of acting on stage, especially in my younger years, but acting on stage versus acting behind a microphone is a totally different animal. So be prepared for that as well, um, which is why it is good to take some classes and to get comfortable with the type of voiceover that you want to do. Um, and then really it's just about getting yourself out there, making a demo that really showcases what you can do and who you are. Um, you know, authenticity is a big thing. And it's funny because, you know, doing characters, you were like, well, you know, you're doing all these weird character voices. It's like, yeah, but these are the ones that really speak to me. Like, I love doing these character voices. So, you know, have that passion. Because again, as, as we talked about, you know, it's, it's, this can be a very tough industry. And so, you know, you want to follow the path that speaks to you. Definitely. I, I just have one question. When you're yeah. If, if you're following the greats, like what do you what do you look for? Like, let's say I'm watching Batman the animated series, and I'm sure. listening to ah, what am I, I you know, love Batman the animated series. Me too. And I'm listening. To, <laughs> I'm listening to Mark Hamill do the Joker classic. Oh, like, what are you God. looking for exactly? Like, if you're trying to get into voice work, what 
I'm just kind of like, are you looking like the highs and lows of the voice or like, how does that work? Uh, I usually look for some, like something that's like a signature for that character. So when I think of the Joker, he has this laugh that he does. That I love, I love Mark Hamill's Joker laugh where he starts low and he builds up into this crazy wild laughter. Laughter, especially for villains, is always a good place to start. I'm going to work my, uh, I'm going to work on my laughter. Work not on not on laugh. this call, but okay. yeah, it might be scarce. We'll I want to hear it, Matthew. I want to hear your Joker laugh. I'll be in touch. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be great. So uh, <laughs> I'm just going to jump into, um, and I, I don't know if I'm uh, interpreting this question the right way, but um, what are some of the outlets to get your video game sounds? Um, do you go to the companies yourselves? I don't know if this is a stock library, like cleared sounds type of question, but I'm curious if anybody has any any thoughts on this um, in terms of maybe getting pre-cleared sounds and stuff like that. I'll just, I'll open it up to the group. I'm not sure if. Yeah, I, I would recommend Splice, um, not just for sounds for video games, but even just for producing. For um, anything just, really. Yeah. For anything you need, any sounds. Yeah, it's very, very low financial investment for a big library. Mm -hmm. Work out of Splice, got it, yeah. cool. Um, and Lauren, Vincent, uh, any, other, any other sound libraries or any places you would look? Yeah, you know, it's funny, I... <sighs> Yeah, I actually interpreted this question totally differently, and I Please was thinking, take it then. Yeah. and and I was thinking, <laughs> yes, uh, I go to video game developers early on because they don't know what they're doing early on when they're just starting a game. You know, they're focused on I'm making a cool prototype, and then once it gets to a certain point, I'll show it to a publisher, or I'll show it to a venture, or I'll show it to somewhere, and at that point, they have no idea what they're doing, like. Um, then once you're in and you can help them out in some way with music, with sound, then there are other things that come afterwards. Like uh, I think I mentioned earlier that I encourage this one indie developer. You know, it's not that hard for you to say sign up with ASCAP, but it's like there's actually a lot of things that go into that as well. So you can say take that company and point them to what it takes to actually become a music publisher. Because just like it's really easy for us as musicians to handle our own music distribution, it's also really easy for video game developers to handle the whole publishing themselves by pointing them to, you know, pointing them to song trust. And so they can handle publishing administration or something like that. Um, so getting in with a developer early, I think is great. And yeah, just going to the companies themselves, there are so many individuals that are out there making video games now. Definitely, and one thing I would add on to that is also, yeah, if you're going to get that score, that soundtrack or whatnot onto digital streaming platforms, whether it's Apple, Spotify, what have you, um, you know, ensure that the delivery is legit. Um, there's a score that I was looking for the other day. I load it up. It's all grayed out. There's something wrong with the delivery. Maybe something wasn't cleared. So just make sure that you're going through the right, you know, channels to do that, whether you're working with a tune core or a Fuga or, you know, with uh, CD baby, et cetera, just, you know, go to, there's, there's no shortage of, 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 of outlets to do this. Um, a lot of the DSPs do have preferred partner links and you can go in there and see who's legit and who's not. Start there just so if you want to get your music out to the masses, make sure that it's actually, you know, available, especially if you start talking about it in Discord and then I go to it, I can't listen to it. You know, that's, there's a break in the communication chain there. So um, cool. I'm, I'm glad that you took the, the question that way. Um, so we, I guess we covered it from both sides. I hope we answered it. And Here's a question I'll lob to the group. Um, what kind of music is marketable for video games in 2021 or 2022? Where is the trend going? Um, the question goes, continues, I arrange lots of beeps and boops, chiptune style of music, but I've noticed that a lot of orchestration, orchestrations for games are leaning towards big orchestral compositions. Um, which do you prefer and what is the demand in the market right now or where do you see it going? Yeah, I'll, I could start. Do you want to go? Too? You yeah. can take it. All I'll right. Go. So, yeah, since I specifically heard like chiptune, mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of our area. Um, so, I would say, yeah, I, I love orchestral music too. Like, that's something we can't touch really. 
if we wanted to do our orchestral soundtrack, we need other outside help. So don't feel too bad that you're lacking in that, you know, territory. Just lean into what you're good at, lean into what you're feeling and what your creative like inspirations are. Um, and just perfect that. And then uh I think that is still viable in 2021. Um just electronic music in general, like a lot of games, indie games specifically, love chiptune. Mm -hmm. um, I still love hearing chiptune in video games. You know, like there's a reason like Undertale and Deltarune did so well. Mm -hmm. um, not all it's chiptune, but it's still old school sounds. Yeah. Uh, like SNES and N64 era sounds. So yeah, there's like a whole yeah. renaissance of that kind of coming back. Yeah. And it's great because, I mean, we are nostalgic for that. Nostalgia is very strong. It's a mm -hmm. very strong emotion. And I don't think there's a, a, any issue with, like, trying to, if that's what you love, then trying to push that onto game devs. It's like, hey, I think this soundtrack would be great with, like, some chip tune. And then follow it that yeah. way. Got yeah. it. I don't mean to cut it off, but we went over just a little bit. Oh, I just okay. wanted to say thank you to, to, to all of you for joining. I hope everyone found this uh, educational and, and, and fun at least. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And I think we're going to get kicked out of the chat some way, somehow. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you, you guys so much.